understand uh, the perception of and the situation of uh, Turkish uh, of uh, refugees in Turkey uh, and the problem of migration in Turkey uh, we have to uh, remember the situation in Europe uh, before the deal from 2016 with uh, with Turkey uh, because the how uh, how Turkish society understands the problem of migration right now is similar with uh, the perception in European society before the before the 2016. For example, like we uh, remember the uh, the debates uh, during 2015 and so on. Uh, and secondly, about the Erdogan's motivation um, to open the gates to Europe. Uh, if we are talking about the opening uh, of the gates from March 2020, um, it was connected uh, firstly with the attacks and killing of Turkish soldiers in, in Idlib and uh, simultaneously with the danger of uh, the new migration wave from this province. Uh, and in connection with the, demos the with, um, domestic reality, I've mentioned before, um, the main motivation for Erdogan uh, was to calm down the mood in Turkish society. Erdogan wanted to give uh, the evidence that Turkey really takes some steps uh, to ameliorate the situation in Turkey and uh, to show that Turks are still the first priority for Erdogan and for the Turkish state. And it's not the Syrian refugees or other refugees, and it's the Turkish people who, uh, who are the first and uh, secondly, we can see uh, this uh, uh, opening as something like a red light signal for us, for the European Union. Uh, it's the signal that the problem of refugee is still real and is still here even after the 2000, 2016 deal. Um, it was the signal that refugees could not stay in Turkey permanently and the Turkey will not take care for them uh permanently and the uh, european union must help turkey to deal with this issue because for them it's not just the problem of turkey it's the problem of all europe because turkey is not the state who started the war in syria and who uh, caused uh, the situation of these refugees uh and now with the economic and other domestic problems in turkey Turkey don't have the capacities to maintain today's refugee status quo at, uh, in Turkey at home. Uh, when it comes to our topic, uh, the situation at the moment at the Greek border uh, with Turkey is mainly political. I mean, uh, uh, the perception, not only in Athens, but also in Brussels, is the fact that the Turkey, the Turkish government in particular, the government of uh, Erdogan, uh, has been blackmailing the European Union to open the border for thousands of uh, migrants, while at the same time the European Union is quite reluctant uh, and it hesitates to take any kind of measures. Um, everything at the same time uh, is related to the developments in Libya, and uh, the gas drillings in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. So we're talking uh, about a quite uh, highly uh, politicized issue. Uh, I heard before that uh, uh, Turkey uh, is not supported sufficiently by the European Union. If you talk to EU officials here, they basically say that they have already provided 6 billion euros to, to Turkey, uh, while at the same time in Lebanon, which basically is a neighboring country and faces similar problems it has got i mean up to up, up, up to date there is no eu funds for the for beirut uh, at the same time uh, it's um, i just want to point out that we're talking about a quite complex political geopolitical situation in southeastern europe it's true that turkey was not responsible for the war in syria 
but it's also true that uh, Turkey uh, got involved in the Syrian war. And uh, when the incidents last February uh, took place at the, at the land Greek-Turkey um, uh, border, uh, the vast majority of these people, thousands of migrants slash refugees at the Greek-Turkish border, were not Syrians, they were Afghans, and from other parts of um, uh, Asia, and even uh, Northern Africa. So, um, as long as the European Union uh, does not come up with a, a concrete, coherent, and united front when it comes to migration policy, and, um, and at the same time, we don't have a solution in the Syrian uh, crisis, Turkey will still have a strong card in its uh, hands. Uh, at the same time, uh, the EU has to deliver its, um, uh, its, its, its promises, uh, according to the 2016 uh, agreement, when it comes to the visa for instance, the liberalization. But in any event, the general atmosphere is that um, the EU, uh, both the EU and Greece, want to de-escalate. Uh, we expect in July to come up with some uh, results in the sense that uh, EU officials basically say that in July they will sit uh, around the table together with Turkey and come up uh, with an overall solution, including uh, migration. Um, and for Greece in particular, and that's a very uh, risky factor, there is another potential, potential risk uh, which derives from the potential uh, destabilization in Libya. According to reports, more than 20,000 migrants are ready to cross the Mediterranean. And even in this case, Greece is the one who is going to foot the bill. Because in order for the operation Irini, the EU operation Irini, which is basically responsible for imposing the arms embargo to Libya, in order for this operation to be enforced and agreed upon among all EU member states, Greece accepted to take potential migrants to its ports. So this is another source of um, uh, migration routes or uh, refugee migration routes. Now the point is that um, I'm afraid that uh, generally, spe generally speaking, uh, this has been for a long time, this is not something new. Both uh, Greek and uh, Turkish governments uh, have been using uh, the bilateral issues for internal consumption to distract people from the public op opinion from uh, the actual problems. However, the migration issue is not uh, an everyday problem. Uh, migration uh, issue involves people, in, involves human lives, and um, I think that uh, many share here in Brussels, at least, uh, the feeling that Erdogan is, uh, is playing very dangerously with, uh, with migrants, because uh, back then, in uh, February, he was basically uh, sending, uh, uh, sorry, March, and then saying February, with them. Uh, he was sending, uh, his government was the one who was sending these uh, refugees at the Greek Turkish borders with uh, buses. So, this is not exactly, uh, the, the Europeans are fully aware of this uh, situation. And uh, I don't know for how long uh, Erdogan himself uh, will be tolerated by Brussels. Let me start with the pandemic perspective on the overall situation of refugees and migrants in the in the in the in Europe. So I would say the um, COVID um, contributed to the fact that in 2020 we see the record low number of arrivals of refugees to Europe in last 13, 14 years. I look at the numbers and. And uh, it seems that, uh, according to UNHCR, uh, this year we had only 25, only in brackets, 25,000 crossings uh, through the Mediterranean Sea uh, to, the, to, East, uh, to, to Southern Europe, which is by far the lowest numbers in the last 10 years. And uh, if the situation does not change in the future, it seems that we'll, there will be no more than 100,000 new arriving refugees or migrants to, to Europe this year, which is by far the, uh, the lowest number in last in last 13 years. The impact of, of, uh, of the COVID pandemic, 167 countries closed fully or partially their borders. 
So we see that there was little traffic inside, inside Europe, uh, very few uh, new arrivals in Central Europe, but on the other hand, uh, the people kept, kept staying in, in uh, southern external border countries like Greece, Malta, Spain, etc. So we by far cannot say that the situation is somehow, uh, has somehow stabilized. The numbers in Greece uh, are still very high. Uh, according to the UNHCR, at the time being, there are 121,000 uh, asylum seekers and, and migrants in, in, in Greece, which is, of course, a lot. And the people are stuck in Greece and uh, cannot really move, move forward because the relocation program was basically stopped. There, are, there is some relocation for, of unaccompanied minors to, to, to Europe, but there is basically no program of, uh, of distribution of the, sh of the burden. There is no burden sharing among the EU member states. There, are, there is always only a coalition of the willing states, if we can call them this way, to accept few hundreds or few dozens of refugees from Greece, from Malta, from Italy. So it's, this is not a system. So uh, we, ha we, have to, we have to face this situation and I hope that uh, there will be some solution maybe outlined in the, in the, in the new pact. Then the second uh, or the third the, the, the deterioration of the situation external borders is, is obvious. So what we can see is that uh, there are uh, significant problems with the rule of law and with illegal activities at the borders. I mean, uh, for example, pushbacks from Greece to Turkey or the totally unacceptable behavior of the, of the police in, or border guards in Croatia, the, the last incidents of, of beating and tying up to the trees, <laughs> the, the, the migrants from, from Afghanistan and Pakistan in the border region between Croatia and Bosnia is just unacceptable. And we see also also breaches of the of the international and European law in in Malta, for example, the, the reluctance the reluctance to accept the boats with uh, with uh, refugees to to Malta are unacceptable. There were 400, uh, 400 refugees on board on board of boats hired by the Maltese government, and uh, they were somehow taken out of Malta in territorial in international waters and wait for them again for the random distribution of, of some states uh, from the coalitions of the willing. So this uh, deterioration of a rule of law and uh, I would also say democracy because some states use the COVID pandemic to, to touch on some basic principles of democracy, for example, Hungary, so this has uh, this was also one of the one of the results of the of the COVID uh, pandemic. For me, very imp very important, Schengen basically became dysfunctional during this during this period of time, which is a big issue now. And uh, and uh, we hope that the borders will be open soon, because it's not only about migration and refugees, but it's about daily life of of, of Europeans. So the, the impact of COVID was, was really sub, substantial. Um, there's a, a huge sense that this really shows again that there's a need for a common European and effective migration approach um, and that this is lacking. And so this was already um, uh, something that was signaled also, for example, by uh, Germany's Europe minister at the beginning of the crisis at the border uh, with Greek and Turkey, Greece and Turkey, and he was saying it's high time that we as the EU finally wake up and develop a sustainable migration concept. And so this is why um, there's on the one hand a lot of expectations that are attached to this pact that will hopefully um, make, <laughs> make public uh, in the beginning of July or the end of June. Um, the migration management objective will be very prominent there. That's something that we've seen as a result of the 2015 and 2016 crisis. The idea that EU has to have 
very better relationships with third countries, that they are a partner in managing migration flows to Europe has been a key lesson for the EU and the member state, and it's very prominent there. And from the intelligence that we, uh, from our side, have picked up, this is an element of the pack that is very much invested in. And so this is also the area where member states agree that action needs to be taken. So we're expecting a lot of emphasis on that in the pact. Um, what will be interesting to understand, though, is um, the, the kind of dependence that we're willing to have when it comes to the third countries. So that's one element. Uh, in the past, our, maybe our relationships with third countries were underdeveloped. A number of member states, for example, Italy had really strong ones, but in general, it was very up and down. And so the question is, good, we're flexing our muscles there. We need to develop those relationships. But on the other hand, the question is, are we more fragile? Are we more vulnerable when actors such as the president of Turkey then take these kind of measures? Are we too dependent on those third countries? And that dependence, of course, is related to the turmoil we see internally, the, the fact that uh, member states amongst themselves cannot agree how to deal with some of these elements internally. And I think that will be, we understand this is still why the pact is not out there, because the negotiations about how that should look internally within, the Europe, within Europe, how are we going to organize migration and asylum management there? There's still so much um, conversations and conflict uh, about that. Um, and that's really important because even if we set up an EU-Turkey deal, even if we set up a deal with a third country, we still have to implement our part of the deal. And there we see how um, some of the problems with the EU-Turkey deal, um, our colleagues refer to this already, the fact that there was um, the element that migrants had to stay in asylum seekers had to stay on the islands and were not allowed to move onwards to the mainland because otherwise they may no longer be eligible to be returned to Turkey meant that so many people were stuck there. The fact that very complex procedures had to be set up to implement the EU Turkey deal to have these people returned resulted in very long asylum procedures, a lot of appeals and a lot of people that still don't know whether or not they will be returned but also for the Greek government that they cannot that they have to wait until a decision is made. So these are really all very important elements. Regarding, uh, I, I will agree with, uh, with Martin, but uh, regarding the new uh, migration pacts, uh, you said that in your initial uh, introduction speech as well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that we will have a, a strong uh, legal framework when it comes to mandatory uh, relocation uh, schemes. And I think that according to the talks that I have, you know, informal talks in the corridors, rumors in Brussels, I believe that, uh, I understand that they are, they, they, will, they will go for the option to have, for instance, every, every member state will, will participate in, in one way or another in the new migration pact. pact. Uh, for instance, they can offer uh, money to build up the Czech Republic or Hungary. Uh, could offer money to build up schools or hospitals on a Greek island, which is where refugees are located, instead of accepting uh, refugees and migrants uh, itself. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm not going. I'm not. I won't be surprised if, in some way, uh, the new recovery fund will also be linked to the migration pact, because they need to find a way to oblige these uh, countries to contribute one way or another. Maybe the COVID pandemic has also shown um, its potential in, in stimulating some kind of solidarity, if I can be the, the optimist uh, here, in the sense that there was a huge frustration from um, countries like Italy, Spain, and others in relation to the effects of the pandemic uh, on their societies, on their economies, and the lack of solidarity of other member states and the strong stances from, for example, the Netherlands to any kind of potential ideas of solidarity on that front. Over the last couple of weeks, we have seen a shift in that regard. And maybe uh, that can be, uh, it was really clear, a number of, of presidents of leaders came out and said, this is a huge test to the EU and the European project. We need solidarity amongst member states. I may have a slight hope that at some point we'll, have, we'll see that same kind of solidarity also in the area of migration. I think it's really clear that EU-Turkey deal has shown that if you set up a deal and you make a single member states 
the gatekeeper, the gateway to migrants, as it was from, uh, for Greece, it has really severe consequences. And so we have, if I can say so, a scar within Europe as a result of that, and that scar lies in, in, in Greece. And we need to really draw the lessons from that and really think through the next time round we come up with an agreement with a third country, who will bear the consequences of that and who will be responsible for implementing that, even if there is, like um, uh, Saranti said, uh, an idea to have flexible solidarity and different kind of contribution of member states. There are very, very different consequences to sending money, to sending staff or border guards versus uh, receiving and integrating refugees who arrive on your territory. And that needs to be really taken into account. In my opinion, we will see something like the flexible solidarity, most likely. And, but um, I think it's uh, not uh, really acceptable for countries like Greece, Italy, Spain, because they have taken the burden for many years instead of all of us in Central and, and Northern Europe. So, and uh, when we look at the willingness of the, let's say, coalitions of the willing states to accept larger numbers of, of refugees, I'm not very optimistic. Look at the numbers of people arriving to Greece every year and look at the numbers of how the countries are willing to accept the most vulnerable unaccompanied minors from Greece. We have a target of 1,600. And uh, I really wonder whether we will manage at least 1,600, the most vulnerable refugees to somehow, somehow distribute. And to be even more pessimistic, I think for the German presidency, there are other very pressing issues to, to on the agenda. First of all, MFF. This is, I think, topic number one for, for the German presidency. Then the big question, Brexit. Then we have the impact of the COVID crisis, I think, in, in countries dependent on tourism, like Greece, for example. It could be a huge question to somehow cope with the, with the consequences of the of the of the COVID because there will be certainly uh, less tourists and less income and more refugees which in my opinion will be a very difficult situation and then maybe at number four number four we have the common european asylum system so i'm i know that the germans are very efficient and and uh, they they work on the papers concerning also the common european asylum system but in my view we will not see a breakthrough in the during the german presidency i think that what we need here is a memorandum of understanding when it comes to, to migration and this basically means that uh, this uh, the implementation of eu rules Either we're talking about the new relocation, obligatory relocation system, or flexible solidarity, or whatever, should be um, uh, conditional. Uh, the, we need to have a high level of conditionality. Um, I got used to this term because for the last 10 years we have been experiencing the Greek economic crisis, so I think that it's high time we implemented that on the migration issue now. So it basically means that. I guess it will be like it could be like the recovery funds. Either we're talking about loans or, or grants. You come up with specific recommendations, a reform plan. Uh, you implement the reforms. You take the money. You don't. You don't get. You don't take the money. It could be the same for the MFF, for instance, and uh, the countries that don't accept refugees or they don't accept giving money to, to countries um, to build up schools or whatever. If they want to, if they don't want to participate in the whole migration pact, then they should not be paid by the EU taxpayers' money. Everything is about money at the end of the day. I'm sorry to say that, but uh, I think that the, this is the this is the only solution. Come to my mind during during this uh, discussion is uh, what uh, we can find uh, like common in the position of the Czech Republic and the, of the position of the Greece and uh, a lot of uh, European Union states and uh, European Union societies who don't want uh, the refugees. And with the Turkish position, who uh, uh, right now is in the similar in the similar state that the society in the Turkish state uh, don't want the refugees uh, in their homeland anymore. Uh, so maybe um, um, the solution of uh, of this migration situation 
uh, probably should change um, in the way to where we can send the people. Okay, we have there in, in Turkey and we don't want to uh, send them to, to Europe, but what to do uh, with them? Uh, yes. I agree with uh, with that uh, with uh, the point that most of the European Union states, the Czech Republic, uh, is one of them, is not responsible for the situation in the in the Middle East uh, and uh, for the for the war in Syria. Uh, but I think that we have to start to think about the solution of of the migration. Uh, from the point of um, like some human solidarity and uh, international humanitarian law, uh, not just for what what we personally want for our country, but more more in in the uh, humanitarian perspective, uh, because the Czech Republic uh, and the Czech uh, foreign policy is like play rooted in in the humanitarian uh, like direction of the foreign policy and probably also the uh, our like view of the migration should uh, start uh, change for this uh, to this direction of the humanitarian uh, position instead of just uh, uh, babish populist uh direction of what people here probably wants and what to, to give him more uh, voters and uh, popularity points and 